Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We're actually going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to call to order the committee meeting for March 21st, 2024 at 5.59 p.m. Dr. Erd? Thank you, Madam President. Good evening to the Board of Directors. Good evening. Members of the admin team and community members that are in attendance. Um, before I go over that, we have five items tonight for committee. Um, but before I discuss those, I want to take a moment and congratulate the cast, the crew that were a part of Cinderella the Musical. Um, it was a wonderful four-day run that they had here last week, finishing up with the matinee on Saturday. Uh, the kids did a great job, uh, tons of effort from having two kids go through it myself. Uh, I know what goes into it, and it uh, showed uh, on the day that I saw it on Sunday. So I just want to also give a big thank you to Anna Goss. She is the director and also producer, and also her assistant director and co-producer, Julianne Wheatley, uh, as well as really behind the scenes, the staging that goes on, the construction of the staging. Uh, there are a lot of families, a lot of parents that are involved in that, and, and they're also the unsung heroes. So just, again, wanted to make light of that and uh, congratulate the production on a very successful run. Okay. We have, uh, I think this school year, 2023-2024 school year, we've been aggressive in pursuing grants and donations. Um, and one of the funds that we're currently pursuing is through the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. It's uh, for school facilities and for upgrades to your school facilities. This appears to be something that hasn't come around in a while, and it only appears to be a one-year funding opportunity that we're pursuing. Um, the, the grant itself uh, is one of those grants that requires a quarter uh, match from the school district for the money. And here to present tonight uh, about this grant in greater detail is Charlene Bedelia. Very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because I was just looking at it. It's, it's on my list. Yeah. It's on the PSBA list. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So as Dr. Oberg mentioned, Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development are offering public school facility improvement program grants. This could be up to $5 million. They are for specific use purposes. They can be used for roof repairs, roof replacements, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, boiler systems, plumbing systems, any type of energy savings projects, health and safety upgrades. Any emergency that may come up that the school would need funding for could be used for that. Accessibility projects, internet connectivity, any demolition projects that are on um, the docket, or window repair, window replacement. So Craig McKee, our facilities director, and I have been talking along with Dr. Oberg to try to find some use for this money. Um, we, are, as you know, are in a bond obligation and have some of that money set aside, so we are actually talking with them, too, to see if we can reconfigure some of our current debt to set that aside to use grant funds if we're approved. We do have to have the application in by the end of April. There is a 25% match. In our conversations internally, we thought if we could get a $500,000 set aside for the 24-25 budget, that would give us enough funds to do a $2 million project. We don't know exactly what kind of project we're going to submit for yet. We're still in the stages of collecting all of our data, research on what we need to have done, um, but we have to move quickly. The tennis court? <laughs> I don't know. So, I saw so that. One of the, one of the uh, <laughs> priority areas that uh, Mr. McKee has spotlighted is ventilation. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. um, there are a couple areas where the ventilation actually in the admin is one of them. Uh, that was last worked on in 2002, 2006. Oh. So that would be one of the key areas that we would have to have. We would partially use that money for us. Oh, thank you. Sounds exciting. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and I think I'm just going to say. Oh, um, so there's no, yes. So, there's, so that's one of the things that's going to be on the agenda tonight for you to consider. Yes. Um, next, is, yeah, while you're there, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to give you a shout out while you're up there. Thank you. If you, if you, if you mind. Um, so tonight, uh, Charlene is also going to present to us a preliminary budget. This is not to be voted on. No. Uh, this is the initial work that, that has gone into this from meetings with our admin team, our, our you know, from Billy principals to the different department heads. 
uh, looking at last year's budget for projecting to next year. But I got to tell you, um, you know, again, Ms. Bedillion started in December, quite honestly. Uh, and in that time, we've had PCCD grants, the DCED grant. Um, we have ESSERS audit for ESSERS three that's going on. Uh, we have a special ed audit uh, for that touches her a little bit. We also have Fed monitoring for the federal programs every three years. I think I shared this with the board the other day. There's a fiscal aspect of it that has its own piece that Charlene has a lot to do on that. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, but having said all that, that's all happening at the same time that she's brand new and uh, putting together a school budget for the 24-25 school year. So I thank you. You're welcome. You I have a lot of lot. help and support. So Absolutely. I have a great team. <laughs> I just want to make that no. So thank you. What I'm presenting to you tonight is very preliminary. We're not going to delve into a lot of actual discussion on this because I know it is going to change. But these are the first indicators of, of what the budget's going to look like for the upcoming year. The state budget has not passed yet, so our state subsidies are still projections. I'm using the projections in this budget of what they are telling us right now. If the budget passes, we will have this amount of money for our basic education and our special education subsidies. So again, very preliminary. So what this budget consists of is anticipated revenues. That's our anticipated tax revenues, our federal and state subsidies and grants and our expected expenditures. So that includes all of the salaries that are going to roll over with our step increases for next year, benefits. Benefits are going to increase in cost. We don't know exactly how much yet. We are anticipating a 10% increase. That is what I've used in this budget right now. Our dental is also probably increasing. We don't know how much. I'm using 5% in this um, preliminary budget. So as you can see, a lot of uh, still unknowns. Um, our retirement payments, that luckily is staying about the same, so we were good there. Um, all of our educational program costs are in this initial budget, our charter and cyber school costs, flood obligations, utilities, et cetera. So everything that we typically see in a state or school budget is in this school budget. Some areas of concern for me are health care expenses. As I said, they are increasing our debt obligation for the 24-25 school year is $3,009,000. So just a little bit of area concern there. And of course, we're exhausting all of our extra fund money at the end of September. But there are areas of opportunity. So some things to be looking forward to. A lot of federal grant money out there. So we are applying to everything that we can to get some additional funds there. We are also ramping up our private donations and sponsorship initiatives, so that hopefully will help us de defray some small costs for supplies and things like that, that that can help us in other areas. So again, very preliminary. I will have more at next month's board meeting. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Steve. Thank you very much. Okay. For the last few months, we've been pre presenting uh, priority mm -hmm. challenges that came from the Future Ready Comprehensive Plan that was developed in the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, in that plan, uh, there are four priority challenges. Uh, we spent the last two months focusing on attendance, and then our student data, as our achievement data at the elementary middle school level. Today, as we promised last time, this is uh, part two of that plan. Uh, Dr. Gartrin is going to present to you uh, the high school data. Uh, Mr. Bonus was also going to present that he I was not able to attend. So again, uh, Dr. Action is going to present the vision and culture of high expectations uh, regarding high school specific data. Dr. Action, do you need me to do that for you? Uh, okay. Yeah. Or, or, or does it? It does work, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, good evening. Um, like Dr. Oberg shared, part two. You know, we had so much fun last month. Wanted to wanted to do it again. Um, but I'm going to try to be brief here since there are five other items still on committee, I believe. So, Ms. Rolf, you can go ahead and click ahead. Um, these first couple are just what we've been looking at um, the past couple times I've presented. So I don't want to 
spend, you know, a bunch of time other than just to point out that there are four key priority challenge target areas that we are focusing on as a district, and those, of course, are attendance, um, a vision and culture of high expectations for success, which is what we did last month and are continuing with tonight. Uh, next month, we will be talking about the goal to recruit and retain fully credentialed experience and high-quality teachers and leaders. And then in May, we will conclude with talking about our partnerships with businesses, community organizations, and other agencies. So, so hi, Mr. Wolf. All right. Um, I think we've talked about the past couple times. There are several key areas that impact um, how we are rated and when we do our building score and the future ready index and all of that reporting. Um, and of course, about 40 points, not about exactly 40 points for your academic achievement, which is the percentage of students in your building who are proficient or advanced. Uh, academic growth, another 40 points, which is the, the PBAS growth indicator and whether students are exceeding uh, the expected growth score. And then for the other academic indicators, attendance and graduation rate. Um, and much of tonight's focus is going to be about graduation rate, graduation requirements, how that works, how that's calculated. Pennsylvania recently made some significant changes to uh, graduation rates and, and graduation pathways, and we're going to talk about that. So go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Um, again, this was our initial year three target, three-year plan with last year being year one, this year being year two, and next year being the conclusion of this phase's comprehensive plan. And so in the midst of all of the other audits and budget stuff that's been going on, I've, I've kept this low on the radar, but pretty soon we're going to need to be working on the next iteration of the comprehensive plan, although I expect it will be a little bit smoother because we, we went through it once. We have a really great um, initial plan, and, and the, the next iteration, I think, will be a, a build upon and an expansion of the, the current plan. So we are already in year two of the three-year cycle for future ready planning, and go ahead, Mr. Wolf. All right, so here is where I want to spend kind of the meat of our time this evening, and you guys should all have this little one-pager um, from PDE, which is, and if anybody in attendance would like one, I do have two extra copies here, um, and I can run more off as well. Um, so uh, what they did with CIS 158 of 2018, um, but like many things in government, it took a few years to take effect and then took a few more years because of COVID. Um, so that last year's graduates were actually the first graduating class for which this act was fully applicable. And basically, the, the history there is the Keystone exams have been in place for a number of years. And it used to be, well, the first goal was 100% proficiency, right? If, if every kid needs to be proficient in all three content areas in order to graduate. And then that kind of got walked back, and it got walked back again. And then there was a period of time where they said, well, they all have to be proficient, but they can do a, a keystone project uh, if they don't meet proficiency. And then, but then the, the keystone project requirements were very individualized to the district. It was lower district, what your high school decided was an appropriate graduation keystone project. And so there wasn't much consistency. Um, I do think with Act 158, they got a lot of things closer to right. So, you know, it, no, and will there ever be a perfect plan or perfect pathway, maybe not, but but I, I think there's a lot of good um, meat behind what uh, Act 158 does. And so basically it spells out a number of different pathways to graduation um, that students can use to meet state requirements to be a high school graduate. And again, this took effect with uh, last, last year's graduating class was the first class for us that this was applicable. They still take all three keystones uh, at the end of those courses. And they can, if they if they are proficient on all three, that's kind of the most straightforward, simplest path forward. If you are proficient in all three, you have met the proficiency pathway for graduation. The next pathway, and you kind of see they're down the down the list in a not a hierarchy, but a a um, a list of of how many steps it takes to meet that requirement or how many areas. 
there is now also a keystone composite pathway, which means if you are proficient in at least one of the three and none of them are below basic and you have a, a overall scale score of at least 4,452, um, then you can meet graduation requirements by being proficient in at least one and not below basic in either of the other two. So that's the composite pathway. Um, the next couple of pathways, alternate assessment, um, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Um, and a lot of those have to do with performance on AP exams, SAT, ACT performance. Um, a couple of them, it's a little bit strange because uh, if a student has struggled to meet proficiency on Keystone exams, it, it's, I guess it is possible but not likely that they would achieve the, the required scores on an exam in the same subject, but for AP or ACT or SAT. Um, the biggest one we use on this alternative assessment pathway is if a child has been accepted into a four-year institution and has that letter of acceptance, then that is considered a approved alternative assessment pathway. Basically, if a university is saying, hey, we're ready to accept this student, we've reviewed their transcripts, we've re reviewed their academics, we feel comfortable mm -hmm. with them, then that can be used as an artifact. Um, we have not, to this point, had any students utilize the evidence-based pathway, but that is basically a combination of different artifacts, and the, and the combinations are on the back if anybody wants to, to look in specific detail, but there's, you basically need um, a combination of three different criteria to be evidence-based pathway. Um, a pathway that we use a great deal, um, given our population and given our CTE program, is the CTE pathway. Um, we have a number of students who meet graduation eligibility through Act 158 by completing a, um, a CTE program either here with our BOAG at Western Area or at Penn Commercial. Um, and then the, the last pathway area is if a student has an individual, individualized education plan, they can graduate based on their IEP goals and progress towards those areas. Um, if there is a student who doesn't hit on any of those different pathways, which again, the majority of students are able to fit into one of those areas. Um, there is also a waiver designation. Um, if you exceed 5% of your graduating class graduating with a waiver, then there is kind of a state look at, like, what are we doing? Why do we have more than 5% of our graduates on waiver? But if it is less than 5%, uh, then it, the, the district and the, the superintendent and the high school principal would have the availability and the option to graduate a child based on waiver. Uh, circumstances like a, uh, a child moves to the district in their senior year and they, you know, it's a unique situation or circumstance. Or if a child has met all of the local graduation requirements, because again, these are the state pathways, but they still have to fulfill local requirements with number of credits, credits in each course area. Um, and so districts do have that flexibility and that freedom to waiver um, as long as it is less than 5% of the graduating class. And so, uh, Mr. Wolf, if you go head on, just to give you guys an idea of where that puts McGuffey um, over the past couple years. So 2023 was the first class uh, under Act 158. And um, you can see the number of graduates in 2023 and which pathway they uh, met the criteria under. Um, now I do want to, Qualify, you see the two asterisks for 2023. So those students were ninth graders when they were due to take both the bio and the Algebra 1 Keystone exam, which means that as long as they passed biology and Algebra 1, they did not take the Keystone, but they were given what was called a non-numeric proficiency. So they basically were automatically given proficient on both biology and Algebra 1, which is why you see 95 students compared to 24 and 25, where those students were, again, required to take all three. So it, it looks really great that we have 95 kids proficient in all three exams, but you always want to know the context behind the data. And so 95 is uh, in large part because many of those students did not have to take bio or algebra one keystones. They were just automatically graded proficiency. Um, you can see this year's graduates, we are well on our way to having all of them meet those pathways, um, and you can see which ones are the biggest, right? You know, a majority are 
either between proficiency or composite, and then CTE is, is definitely our next biggest. Um, and you can see we don't have a ton in the, either the alternate assessment or evidence base. Um, when they are an alternate assessment, it's typically that four-year institution um, enrollment that that is triggering. Um, and the other last thing I would point attention to is I know 2025, it still says eight are to be determined. Um, that is some students, some of those students, maybe not all, but at least some of those eight students potentially are in a CTE program right now, and it's just a matter of will they reach completion in that program that could move them to a CTE pathway. They um, may even retest on one of the keystones next winter, and that may even trigger some of them to go to either proficiency or composite. So, again, just a snapshot of where our students currently fit into those various pathways. Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. All right, um, something we were proud of, speaking of graduation rates, and I, I guess that's one of the biggest things I'd hope we take away tonight is um, when it comes to graduation rates and graduation requirements, um, that's an area of strength, I think, for us as a district, that you can see our historical four-year rates, um, and when Mr. Bonus and I went over this earlier, we thought it was important to also add context that this is specifically the four-year data. So if a child graduated, but they graduated in their fifth year or even their sixth year, they are still graduating, but they are not counting in the four-year graduation cohort. So our actual percentage of students who are enrolled who graduate is going to be even a little bit higher than the four-year rate. But this is specifically the percentage of our enrolled students who graduate in a four-year cohort. Um, and you can see we have been consistently at or above 90%, and in, 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 in most of these years, we've been well above 90%. Um, and you can see kind of students at McGuffey compared to the statewide graduation rate. And then at the bottom, you can see the statewide goal is that 92.4% of students would graduate um, statewide by 2033. And so we feel pretty good about that. We feel pretty good that our students are reaching graduation requirements. Um, and again, that's that's the goal, right? Like test proficiency absolutely is important and it is one of the paths to graduation, um, but having it opened up for other avenues to career readiness especially, um, it, it allows us to kind of do some other stuff. So Mr. Wolf, you can go head on. Um, for the Keystone specifically, and I, I uh, realize everyone may be familiar with kind of how this works, but I always try to approach it as uh, you know, a way for, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, algebra one, most students take during their ninth grade year. We do have a small number that take it during their eighth grade year. Um, biology is all ninth grade. So students take, most students will take both the algebra one and bio keystone at the spring of their ninth grade year, unless they had algebra as an eighth grader. Um, Literature is then their sophomore year, and so at the end of their sophomore English class, they would then take that third Keystone exam. Um, the way the windows work, and Keystones are a little bit different than PSSAs, that because they're an end of course exam, as opposed to an annual you know, checkpoint, students can retake those uh, after they've already completed the course and taken the exam the first time. And so Pennsylvania offers three windows, Spring, which is primarily your first time test takers, winter, which is majority of um, retakers, and there also is a summer window. McGuffey has not, um, in my time here, I don't believe we've ever had summer test takers. That's just, we don't, we've not had a need to do so, um, but you do have an option to do a summer testing window if the district would, would choose to do that. Um, and lastly, when we look at the proficiency numbers, um, it is different than PSSAs in that it waits for the 11th grade cohort to account for any retakes. And so it's not like as clean and cut and dry as PSSAs, like, hey, they take it, then we immediately know the proficiency percentages because we have to wait until those freshmen retake as sophomores and so on. And so, Mr. Wolf, you'll click on, um, just very quickly, uh, this is the same information, the same targets that we looked at last month, but I just wanted to plug in the Pennsylvania averages for each Keystone exam um, so that we could kind of see where the state is. I don't want to, you know, dwell on this necessarily because I'd rather focus on the time we have on our specific student data, 
But again, those averages, when we're talking about keystones, is based on each year's 11th grade cohort of students with the assumption that by the end of their 11th grade year, they're probably done retaking exams, uh, most likely. They could take even in their senior year if they're trying to reach that proficiency pathway or, or, um, or composite pathway, but most of the time, by the end of junior year, they've tested this number of times they're going to test. So, Mr. Wolf? All right. So, like I said, because of it being composite and based on the proficiency at the end of their 11th grade year, um, I wanted to give one example of kind of what that means for us when we're trying to figure out what's our actual proficiency on each exam. And so uh, you can see the, the full timeline. This is the current juniors. So they just finished their cohort snapshot. We just did the winter retakes um, back in January. And so the, the green number all the way to the left is the total proficiency percentage that that class of students reached after the winter retakes this winter were accounted for. And so for Algebra 1, you can see how it's a, a kind of a, a moving scale based on circumstance, grade level, retakes, that the very first spring, you see, hey, we had 81% proficient because there were only 21 test takers, which is the class of 21 students who took Algebra 1 in eighth grade. Um, typically, that's students who are academically um, excelling and accelerating, which is why they take Algebra 1 a year sooner, and so you, you do see a high proficiency percentage out of that initial group. Um, then you can see as it moves along, a couple more kids reached proficiency. I think that was one more student in that retake, so we're up to 85. Spring of 22, um, you have all of your students now in Freshman Algebra 1. They all take the exam you now have a, a total of 36% of the 118 test takers proficient in Algebra 1. And then you, you follow it from there. Um, and what we've seen, and you can see this across kind of each content area, literature is a little different because they don't get to take the first test until later in the timeline. If we're both Algebra 1 and Bio, it allows them a, a more, way, more runway for retakes. Um, but what we typically see as we get a, you know, a chunk of students with the first test that are proficient or advanced. Then we pick up, uh, you know, a handful of percentage of students the first time that there's a retake for that group. And then with each subsequent retake after that, it kind of flatlines, right? Um, and you may have more kids still retaking, but you're not seeing a ton of additional gains after one retake. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one is, with each retake window, you're getting further and further from actually taking the course. Um, and there are remediations we do. They, they pull kids during Highlander period uh, leading up to the retake exams and do like a crash course for, for you know, the content and, and the, the instruction. Um, but the other factor at play, and, and I think this is an important discussion for us as a district, um, is the, the reason to continue retaking. If a child has met composite or they've met CTE or they've met, you know, one of those other approved pathways to graduation, and yet we would still continue having them retake, at, at that point, the only marginal gain would be we might boost our proficiency percentage, you know, one or two more percent, right? And so uh, our kind of philosophy at the high school to this point, and that's not saying this couldn't change, but it, it's primarily been, hey, everybody takes it at the end of course and everybody gives their one retake, but at that point, if you have met one of the approved pathways to graduation, uh, we're not going to continue retesting you time after time after time for, for very minimal gain or return. Um, and so there is, there is a trade-off there, right, because part of that building score is based on proficiency percentage. Um, again, not a huge trade-off because, like you can see, after the first time they retake, it's not as if we're gaining a, a lot more proficiency numbers um, after the first retake anyway. So that's, that's kind of how that's laid out, and I just thought this was the most helpful way visually to kind of explain what's going on and how we reach those ultimate numbers as far as proficiency percentages for each grade. So, go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Um, last couple items here. Uh, we talked about the, the growth in PBOS last month, and so I won't – um, spend a bunch of time here, but I did want to go ahead, you can go to the next one as well. Um, 
just to show our Keystone exams and our growth over the past two Keystone administrations, uh, 2022 and 2023 test year. And so you can see um, Algebra 1 has been, um, you know, not all the way where we want it to be, but, but we are seeing kids improve and grow their performance based on where they came into Algebra 1 um, and literature. Uh, we're seeing very positive uh, gains in terms of what they're doing based on their previous assessment. Um, and I do, I do want to spotlight biology um, because it is up there, right? And we said so we, you either embrace the, da the data as it is, good, good, bad, or, or indifferent, or you try to, right, like avoid it and, and dodge it. And I, I don't ever want to be in the business of dodging something that could help us better serve our kids. Um, and so this whole year, we have been focused on solve science, um, rewriting all of their curriculum, all of their content. They've had daily collaboration, um, and at least one day of that week, um, administer myself and principals and Dr. Oberg will push in with them to meet and touch base and talk about progress. Um, we've been doing some, some research into uh, core resources to update for 612 science, um, and lastly, um, driving a good bit of this is that Pennsylvania is changing science standards altogether um, with next year being the first year of implementation and then the 25-26 uh, school year being the first year of live assessment for the new steel standards. And so um, what I would say and, and kind of have everybody keep in mind for that biology is absolutely like we, we know that's an area that we need to focus on. It's an area we're hoping as we go through the next few years that we see that start to move forward. Um, and our science teachers, they definitely take great pride in what they're doing. And, and I know that they, um, they would, would want to say the same, that they're, they're working on it. They're actively trying to come up with ways that we can, can better serve our students. And I know last month, um, Mr. Bonus had you uh, look at the new course progression for high school. Everything we're doing is, is designed to try to drive that forward. So go ahead, Mr. Wolf. All right, uh, last couple things here, um, and I know this was shared previously, but we have um, something to celebrate kind of at the academic end of our high school program, which is our advanced placement students. Um, and there were only four high schools, I believe Mr. Bonus said, in Washington County that received any level of AP honor roll selection. Um, Cannon Mac, Peters Township, Chartiers Houston, and McGuffey. And so, um, basically, what is up here, um, you can see that all of the AP content courses that we offer in our high school, and then you can see the one, two, three, four, five represents the number of exams in each uh, course and the, the number of exams with that score. And so for AP, a score of three or above is considered a qualifying score from a, a college um, standpoint. Um, and then, of course, a one or two would not be a qualifying score, but those students did still get the benefit of, of that program. And so we're, you know, proud and encouraged that, and we did the math earlier, so if you add those up, it's about 56% of our test takers received at least a three for a qualifying score. And, you know, a, a number of, of fours and even several fives on those AP exams. And so it was both because of our performance and because of our participation numbers that we were selected for that uh, bronze AP school honor roll for 2023. So that I wanted to make sure that was noted. And then the last slide, and we'll see if I hit my target timeline, but um, <laughs> this is just another reminder of um, how we've updated our targets for the academic achievement and, and culture of excellence and some of the things that we are aiming to accomplish or make significant progress towards uh, during this school year. So that is uh, kind of part two, talking about Keystone's high school graduation requirements and pathways. Um, if anybody has any questions or, or thoughts, we'll certainly be, be happy to field them. Yes, Ms. I Jackson. have more questions so that everybody understands. Mm -hmm. um, say, individuals with pathways to graduation, while some may be simpler than others, there isn't like one that's better than the law. The idea is that it provides a more individualized pathway to meet the student's capabilities. So I just want yes, to correct. absolutely. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's as long as they meet somewhere on that list, they are considered college and career ready. They are considered from a state of Pennsylvania standpoint, 
ready to, to matriculate from high school. So that, that's a great point that some of them, you know, require less steps or less documentation, but it's not as if someone meeting one of the other pathways is less prepared for life. And in some, I, I can think of a number of kids in my own schooling experience that were probably distinguished on every test, but were not prepared for college or career, right? So yes, absolutely, it, it's not a hierarchy. It's just kind of a, uh, a number of different ways forward. Good, good question. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Great. Thank, Thank you, everybody, Thank for your you. time. Thank you. All right. Okay. Next item actually is to discuss the uh, new logo. Uh, the presentation uh, will give you a little bit of background on this. Um, going through this year, as we were looking at uh, projects that um, had to be addressed from a facility standpoint, one of those areas was actually a new scoreboard. We currently use a, a digital scoreboard that, uh, at present in our current high school, middle school gymnasium, uh, there are not parts for the upkeep of that. So that's really just waiting for um, something to happen where it's not going to work anymore. So going into the year, we actually had it budgeted so that we would have a new board, which we'll have installed uh, around uh, end of uh, May, early June. Why I tell you that is, as we were looking at and working with Vince Schmidt, our high school and middle school computer teacher, we recognized that the logo that we currently use, the highlight that you see when you walk through uh, the gym uh, doors, uh, was created in 2002. And it's a very fine logo. Uh, it's something that we all take pride in. But at the time it was created, it was created as one file image. It is what's called a JPEG. And again, nothing wrong with that either. That can be used to create uh, images on a shirt. It can be used in emails and videos and those kind of things. The problem that we found with that image, let's stand up here, here, was that when it was created, it was created as one file source, which limits the way in which we can display it moving forward with current technology. And two, as we started to create this image, for the new video board, what we found that as we started to enlarge it, it became very pixelated. So now the image would go from a crystal clear image that we're used to to being very blurred, blurred out. And again, the reason for that was it was created in 2002 as the district underwent uh, the last renovation that occurred here. This was part of the architect's plans, part of the process, part of the price in doing so, and it's something that we've adopted. There's a lot of history here, there's a lot of pride here, heritage that goes along with this. We wanted to, as we started to talk about updating this, we wanted to remain true to this image. It has been here for well over 22 years. Again, it is displayed in many ways. In fact, it's not something that's going to necessarily go away. We just want to have an upgrade. And I heard it said recently that we're not changing. So, I want to give you a process. And one other thing I want to mention too, uh, this was something that initially when we started looking at this, we really would have loved to have some kind of contest, uh, a voting possibly even amongst our students, our student body. Uh, that, that's exciting to me. But as we started going through this, one of the things we recognized was that the changes were incremental. Because we weren't creating a brand new image, we really were trying to replicate this, but update and modernize it. There wasn't like the stark contrast. I mean, I'm going to show this with you. So, this was the very first image uh, partnering with a graphic designer in Florida that he came back with. The reason why I see this, the reason why I want to show this was this individual works with school districts, he actually works with uh, universities and colleges to create logos. We actually found him because he has created a highlighter logo for two schools, one in outside Philadelphia, McKean, and then one right across the way in New Jersey called McLean. Both are highlighters and both have an image. And what he was trying to share with us was, as you move forward into the digital age, and you have this on a video board, you want to have clean images. Not a lot of colors, not a lot of detail, like the former individual was. So this was the very first image that we got. Now, some things that you'll note, if I go back, we'll actually move, no, I'll go back to it. The MCG. Again, when it was created in 2022, or 20, 2002, I'm sorry, 
you'll see that our current MCG no longer represents that on that on that board. Second, as no, I have not seen the original, this is the highest resolution that we have, but notice the right hand. It looks to me that there's probably some kind of score or something at that time, but we know in time for crisis that's no longer there. So taking this image, we want to stay as true as we could before, and this was the first image. Now it came about a step. We have a new MCG logo and what should be a shield. And I'm important to details, but there were calls, there were video calls that were between myself, Ed Dalton, our athletic director, uh, Mr. McKee, and also Ben Schmidt, again, our computer teacher, about this image. Okay, so that's where we started. This would be version one of where we started. <laughs> this is version two. The other thing that we recognize, for uniformity's sake, for consistency's sake, is that we also need to have a tough color palette. What we found as we look at our sports organizations and we look at the ways in which our logo has been displayed, we didn't have a color palette that resided and that would help with the way we display this image. So we also want to make sure that we have um, for ourselves, for the Madonna Switcher, a color that we represent the gold, the blue, and also actually gray. So we started messing around and looking at what we had when it comes to the Vegas Gold. That's the color that we use currently. And there are multiple types of Vegas Gold. There are multiple different types of Vegas Gold. The navy blue, again, there's different shades of navy blue. And then actually, and I didn't realize this until I looked at the logo. Do you guys know what the third color actually is predominantly in our logo? We've got gold, we've got blue, what's the third one predominantly? White is actually a good call. I didn't even notice this until we really started looking at this. It's actually red. Red in the bonnet, red in the plaid, red on either side of the shoes. So we, that was the one area we kind of moved away, was it predominant. So not only were we moving towards having a logo and would have a color palette that would be sustained throughout, whoever uses this logo, whether it be our youth teams or high school teams, uh, whether someone's using it internally as a t-shirt, you would have a color palette to it. This would be version two. So you can see how it's drastically changed from the very first. This was the version I shared with you folks about a month ago, not Friday enough. This was version two. Okay. And what happened there was it said, that was like a health gap, to make it look like a shield. Um, and then we start saying, this is the area, the tartan. The way the tartan looks doesn't look like a tartan color or plaid color. That was, the, that was the thing that was like driving us all moving forward. Okay. So we went from version one, version two, to version three. Subtle changes throughout. One of the things that you'll notice, something that's new, uh, it's a Braveheart look. And that is, if you notice over his right eye, as he's looking out, it would appear to be a shadow. That's actually supposed to be more pain. And as we were looking at this, we were like, well, here it looks like it's just a shadow. Here it looks a little bit better, but it doesn't really blend in well. Okay? The other thing we want to recognize in this individual study to do for us was we wanted to have just the torso from the head up as a possible alternative to having the full size. So, and this is where the detail really started to pop for us. We recognized we needed to have more detail. So we went from having a gold war paint across the right eye to a blue. Also what you noticed too in the last two versions was there's more detail and character to the eye. A lot of times you won't see detail there, but to be true to the original highlighter, to you actually see his eye, we actually have that highlighted disease. And the other thing with that is because this will be another version. It is in the belt buckle on top of the sash. You've added the MCG logo. Okay. Let's get to the final version. Right. Oh, actually, there's just a couple of little. So this is. This <laughs> it's not the final version. But you can see, it was always these incremental changes with never anything big, with never anything would say, hey, you put this out to the students, let them vote on it. This was something that I took to the other team. And I said, here's the choices. You probably look at it and say, 
Raiders from Detroit. Yeah. We actually did. We really looked at it. It was like one of those games you play, like, you know, we're trying to figure out what's different about <laughs> focus than that. But the first thing I'll point you to is the top part. This is one of the five Harden. This actually has two different colors. You have the gold end here, and the blue end up here. You also notice how it goes to the top. And a little but important detail that Graphic Artists helped us understand was the outline of the cake. The outline of the cake. Very important when you're putting it on to fabric, especially, uh, that it either is going to stick out in the top or it's going to melt in the back. Very important. Very important detail. Again, look at the similarities. Even the top here, those are two different parts of it compared to that. So after going through all that, that talk to the IM team working with the detailed out bit of these it's going to be the final <laughs> first. Here we go. Now, who notices the difference between the two that I'm showing you? Because what happened was, if we put this back, we said there's one thing that we can't all agree upon. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 Gray on one bowl and the other. And again, this gray will work on darker uh, backgrounds, but it all will too. When, if the board approves this tonight, we're going to actually have both images made available to us uh, on this. And not only we have both images done in gray and gold. Okay, yeah. We'll also have. Oh, yeah. And the torso up. And it will have the buckle that has the MCG, so you'll be able to see the MCG actually in the buckle. You don't see that in the full image, but you do see that here. And all of this were safe. This was um, blown up the version of the original. You see how similar we we stay. We wanted to stay true to that original image, but also updated it for the way we're going to dance it um, in a consistent manner. And the final picture? There you go. So I have 2022 present. My proposal tonight is to make this 2024 future. So again, the image that we have right now, we walk through the gymnasium. That's fair. That's going to be there for a while. It's not that we're going to go away from this. But as we this is approved tonight, this is something that we're going to have to move forward. As having it consistent, and also to having consistent in all of our buildings. So it's going to be our brand. Moving forward, you'll see this image in both our elementary and in middle school and high school. Will the image be copyrighted? Yes, the image is copyrighted. This is going to be our image with our color scheme. Yes, that's all part of it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then the, the last item on today's night that I have is. Uh, Ms. Trump and I were talking, and I felt, <clears throat> for, for the, from a board perspective, and by the way, Ms. Trump is our school solicitor, that she would periodically provide the board with information and advice regarding um, board governance, Robert's Rules of Order, um, and updates on school board procedures that sometimes can change a lot. So. Tonight, Ms. Shrimp is here to present on aspects of school board protocol. So, Ms. Shrimp. Thank you, Dr. Oberg. So, in your packet, you guys do have a, a five-page memo. I promise I won't read it, and I will keep it brief. Uh, I'll just hit the highlights, give you a 10,000-foot overview. So, tonight, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the concept of deliberation, because I know transparency is a big concern and a big issue. So I really wanted to have a little conversation with the board about what is deliberation under the Sunshine Law. So the Sunshine Law is a pretty simple law, and it requires that any time a government body holds a meeting in which deliberation, I mean, and I am quoting that word, I'm using air quotes, but in my, in my paper here it has real quotes, or official action by a quorum of its members takes place, the meeting must be open to the public after public notice of the meeting. So the number one question, right, is what is deliberation? And deliberation is the discussion of agency business that is held for the purpose of making a decision. So if you aren't discussing agency business, you're not deliberating by, by the nature of the definition. Agency business is defined by, in the act as the framing, preparation, making or enactment of laws, 
policy or regulation, the creation of liability by contract or otherwise, or the adjudication of rights, duties, and responsibilities, but not including administrative action. So, you got all that? <laughs> Super easy, right? So, you would think most meetings, you know, most meetings are agency business, and they are. There are some times that an agency, that a meeting is not considered deliberation. Um, discussion of items that are, like we just said, that are not agency business are clearly not under the Sunshine Law. Issues that you're going to discuss that you aren't going to decide are not under the Sunshine Law. Uh, one of the big things is a board retreat. You know, how, how the team of 10 gets along with each other, you're never going to take official action on that but you do need to meet to do that. So you get to meet in, in private to do that. It's not, it doesn't fall under the sunshine law. And this is the big one, and it's, it's in bold in your little packet. That's an issue to familiarize oneself with that issue can qualify as deliberation as long as a majority of the members are present. And, and you will hear me say, that's why I get nervous about group emails, that's why I get nervous about group text, because those things are technically a meeting of the deliberative body. It's a meeting of you guys if you have a nine-person group text chain. So those are included, so that's why you need to be careful. Um, the way I like to see it as a board member is you want the information to flow to you and, and gather information. You don't want to start to discuss it. It's a discussion that gets you in trouble. And, and this is a problem that solicitors face is the initial comment is never the problem. It's the back and forth. So someone says something, okay. Someone else replies, and then the solicitor's like, whoa, 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 back up. And everyone starts to think, oh, well, the solicitor's trying to keep me quiet. They don't want me to, to talk about this. That's not the case. It's that exchange that makes it a deliberation. So the very last page of your little packet, I created a flow chart. I'm pretty proud of my flowchart. <laughs> <laughs> and the first, like, so when you're reviewing emails and you're trying to think, am I going to engage in deliberation? You can always refer to your, your handy dandy flowchart here. First question is, is the topic we're discussing agency business? So if we're all going to stand around and talk about who we've got in the NCAA poll, we're totally good. If we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the McGuffey Highlander new logo, we're going to take official action on that tonight. Probably not a good idea to talk about that. So if the answer is yes, we move on. Are we engaging in discussions on this topic? If it's only informational, no sunshine law violation. We're great. If we are engaging in discuss discussions, the very next question becomes, is the topic covered by executive privilege? So there are exceptions to the sunshine law. They're in the executive session part. Executive privilege is limited to certain items. Those items in involve collective bargaining strategy, grievance strategy, personnel, safety and security, criminal investigations, quasi-judicial deliberations, litigation, and the purchase or lease of real estate. So if we're talking about one of those things, perhaps the deliberation is okay. However, if it's not, stop. Just stop. Put a little stop sign in front of yourself and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't get into this. Maybe we should talk about it in an open session. So quick and quick for you guys, but wanted you to understand a little bit that deliberation usually comes with the second action. So again, it's not that anyone's trying to silence anyone or quash anyone's, anyone's speech. It's more that that's, that's what triggers it. And, and in this little packet, I gave you some suggestions uh, of how to handle when people come to talk to you. And read through them, spend a little bit of time, and see how the one section kind of stop. Like my suggested, this is how I would suggest you handle it. That kind of stops the concept of let's talk back and forth. And then the second example shows you how it can spiral really, really quickly. And I just made that up, and Dr. Oberg says that that's a, that's a familiar thing that happens in, in some emails sometimes. And I know that happens in every district that I represent. Because it's very easy. Email is very quick. And it's stream of conscious. You're like, oh, I want to respond to that. But let's, let's think about taking a step back and not doing that and staying legal. So, thank you. 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 Thank you.
we have to do it in a public meeting. When in a public meeting can we do it? So it depends on what the issue is. <laughs> like I, I raised in here, um, I used an example of you know, somebody wants to discuss a certain topic, reach out and ask to have a put in committee first so it can be discussed, and then it gets goes on the committee agenda just like this is today, and then it can get added to an agenda if the majority of the board thinks it's something that they would like to add to the agenda. But the first step would be contacting board leadership and the superintendent and asking about it being discussed in the committee meeting. Correct. Does it have to be on the committee agenda to be discussed in committee? Or is the committee time still an opportunity to bring up something? So the committee agenda, the agendas are set, right? Mm -hmm. And Act 65 says that you can't discuss items that aren't listed on your agenda. Mm -hmm. if, if there's something that you would like to bring up, I mean, certainly talk to your board president, talk to your superintendent, and, and get it on the on the agenda. Is that committee okay. and meeting? I'm sorry? Is it both the committee meeting and the, the regular meeting? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I had one other question. With with the board meetings, I know there's um, with the Sunshine Act, things have to be public except for those executive sessions. Yes. So with like the board retreats, for instance, do those have to be um, advertised and made available to the public? No. She just went over that. No, because they're not agency business. Got it. Okay. Since they're not agency business, they don't fall under the Sunshine Act at all. Got it. Okay. So, that, so again, that's your first question. Is it agency business? Right. The answer is no. There is no Sunshine Act. You just kind of do what you would normally do. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. So if I understand it correctly, if it's not on the agenda, we can't talk. Yes, that's correct. That's Act 65. Thank you, Ms. Schrimp. Thank you. Thank you. That's all Madam President I have. Okay. We are going to end the committee meeting at 6.56 p.m., and we will reconvene for the regular meeting at 7 p.m.
staying ready. Oh, you're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay. At this time, I will call to order the regularly scheduled board meeting for March 21st, 2024 at 7.02 p.m. Roll call, please. 7.02. Present. Present. Mr. Present. Mr. Barnett. Here. Mr. Present. Mr. Barnett. Here. Mr. Here. 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 As we began last month um, with a, the board had decided we wanted to begin each meeting with a prayer prior to the pledge. Um, and this month, um, Pastor Jake Judy from West Lake Inter Methodist Church is here to pray. Um, so if you'd like to participate, you can join us. Yeah. I'll, I'll caution your ears and I'll stand back. So let's pray. God, who is the way, the truth, and the life, we thank you for bringing these people together here in this place. We pray, God, that you would fill their words with mercy and their ears with grace as they seek to make good decisions for this school and for the community. Lord, we pray that you give them rest from worry and confidence in the outcome of their time together. And when it is time to conclude, God, we pray that you would bless them with safety in travel, that they may find rest for the night, joy in the morning, and assurance that your grace goes before us all day long. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we will have um, Middle School Student of the Month for March 2024. Recognition. Good evening. Miley Main is the Middle School Student of the Month for March. <laughs> the Student of the Month is nominated and voted on by the teachers. Miley shows consistent preparation, respect, involvement, dedication, and empathy at the middle school. We are proud of her and her attributes to McGuffey Middle School. Miley is currently an eighth grade student and has maintained a 4.0 her entire middle school career. It is not uncommon to pull her grades and see 103 or 102%. Miley is an active member of the NJHS and student forum. She enjoys playing volleyball, basketball, and softball. She would like to shout out all of her teachers. She loves them all so much she could not name just one. She knew I'd be listening. <laughs> Miley values her time with her siblings, Izzy and Tucker. She loves the simple moments just hanging outside with them. Her advice for her peers is always to get your work done on time. Miley, we are honored to have you at Modesto Middle School. Thank you. Time we will have high school student council representatives. It looks like she's coming straight from track. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's great. How did it go? Really good. Yeah, How it's looking it? pretty promising. So, um, hello, I'm Lydia Henderson. I'm vice president of student council. Um, I'm going to start with some school updates. So, this past weekend, the McGuffey Drama Club performed Cinderella. It was a great turnout. Um, a lot of people came to see the show, which is a good, good sign. Um, the advanced placement courses are completing their mock exams in preparation for the final exams in May. The Carnegie Science Center spent a week on our campus teaching science classes through project-based activities last week. Um, employees from Range Resources worked side-by-side -side with the students in agricultural mechanics and engineering technologies on Monday to construct a sheep feeder for the annual Running of the Wool event in May. The McGuffey High School chapter of the National Business Education Honor Society will be April 11th 
with 12 new inductees, and the junior prom will be held on Saturday, April 27th at Ogilvy. Now for our sports, I'll try to get through this without coughing, the cool weather is like coming up <laughs> soon. Um, so for girls basketball, here were the all-conference teams, all-conference athletes. For girls basketball, we had Lexi Ewig, Madison Gasso, and Taylor Schumacher. For boys basketball, we had Grayson Wallace and Aiden Cunningham. For wrestling, oh, it's a long list. Uh, Tucker Maine, Lane Ely, Emmett Wolf, Lucas Barr, Victor Bonus, Garrett Newman, Logan Rainier, and Reed Teagarden. For rifle, we had Riley Dunn, Abigail Noble, Marcus Ray, Sarah Closter, and Rachel Cox. Um, and special congratulations to Riley Dunn, who won the PIAA championship in three position shooting competition. Congratulations to Riley. Um, for baseball, we have eight starters returning. Um, we've only played one game so far, and we're currently 0-1. Praying for them. <laughs> Southwell has seven starters returning, and we've played two games, and South Allegheny was today. I don't know how that game turned out. Um, they're currently 1-1. One one. Tennis, the boys tennis has 15 players out for the team. They lost two tight matches. They're currently 0-3. I don't know why that's on here, but hopefully they do. <laughs> um, for track, we have 60 athletes. Um, we had our first scrimmage today versus Waynesburg High School. Looking like a great spring. We invite everybody to attend in the upcoming games. We will have public participation on agenda items. Chief? Madam President, we have four, and first I'd call Vicki Jordan, Buffalo Township. Hello, everyone. Vicki Jordan, Buffalo Township. I really wanted to complain about the logo, but I can't. <laughs> 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 anyway, I just want to start by saying, I want to be clear, I support sport programs, and I support FFA, and I recognize the importance of these programs, but with our current budgeting issues, I continue to have questions reg regarding financial requests outside of our current budget. I don't know why I get nervous every time I'm up here, and then my breathing goes crazy. Anyway, H5 on the agenda. Ask the board for approval. It's in regard to the basketball trip. But it doesn't ask for any financial support in that. It says it's covered. So my question is, if the FFA has their own budget, as stated at the last meeting, why do their requests not appear the same? I would like someone at some point to explain to me why the FAA, FFA requests appear to be asking the board for further financial support outside of their budget. If this is not the case, then I ask why is HF, why doesn't the FFA request read the same as HF? H5. Every request from FFA has a financial request from the district, and you voted yes every time. Moving on, L1, which is that million dollar, half million dollar request, which, hey, that all sounds great. So if we can get funds that help, my question is, do we currently budget half a million dollars for Environment, environmental repairs in our yearly budget? And if not, how is earmarking that amount of money even possible with our current budget deficits? And then L6 on the agenda is in regard to the tennis courts. So my questions are, how long will this $42,233 patch job last? What is the dollar amount allocated for the tennis, tennis department within the athletics budget? Is there offside courts that could be utilized 
to avoid this huge cost, which is clearly not included in any budget. Is there something that is this something that can be in, included in the 24-25 budget and be part of the sports budget and not the general budget? And everything else I have is not agenda. So I thank you for your time, and I hope somebody will get back to me with answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President, until Jen Litton, West Alexander. Hi, everybody. I actually didn't think I was going to make it tonight, but I did write a letter that I um, attached and put to everyone. So, but I was able to make it. So, I just wanted to come and talk to everybody about um, our basketball court coach being very inappropriate and abusive to the kids. So that's the bottom line. Um, I talked to Dr. Oberg this morning. I didn't follow the chain of command, which I didn't understand. I didn't know there was one. However, in Coach's contract, he does state in there that we're not to come in as parents. So I don't have the contract with me, but I will try to find it and share that with everybody. So I'm not sure where we go from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Bromley, Clayville. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry if my face becomes red or I begin to uh, kind of get shaky in my voice, but I'm quite angry. I'm here to talk about Coach Andrew, Andrew and his abuse to our girls. Um, the U.S. Center for Safe Sports considers this abuse, or it is abuse sorry, emotional abuse specifically, behaviors and actions that cause emotional harm to another person, including verbal acts, screaming at, berating, insulting, body shaming, or ridiculing someone, physical acts, punching walls or throwing objects at someone. Uh, Coach Andrew has done most of these things, and I believe it's been reported to Coach Dalton. I know it's been reported, and uh, Coach Andrew has kicked steel doors and bended them in front of our girls uh, during halftime. Uh, he's thrown basketballs on those hit girls. And um, I'm not as involved as, as some of the parents. My daughter's a sophomore. I don't attend all the games. He's also been face-to-face -face with our girls, uh, screaming at some of them. And I'm going to be collecting information uh, from these parents. Sadly, it's gotten to this point. This stuff's been going on for over a year. And, uh, and I'll be taking appropriate action. Some of these things sound like child lineable offensive, offensive. And, uh, you know, it's very upsetting as a parent that it's gotten to this point. Uh, Mr. Dalton has been at the game and witnessed him uh, swearing and yelling at the girls individually for mistakes. And that's not okay. That's abuse. And uh, so as Mrs. Litton indicated, uh, we signed a contract at the beginning of the year that uh, Coach Andrew uh, – doesn't, you know, accept us to sign a contract with women to go to him because he doesn't listen to parents. Uh, there's a lot of problems here. I hope you guys take swift, swift action. Uh, I sent most of, I'm pretty sure all of you, including Coach Dalton, an email um, last night. Uh, so you've been informed, and I'm informing you now. Um, also, there are other acts of abuse, uh, denying attention or support, isolating someone. Uh, for extended periods of time, for, um, for excluding an athlete from practice. Um, I believe my wife sent some text, me text messages that are inappropriate that after one child quits uh, because of this abuse, uh, he followed it up with text messages in a, in a thread uh, that he, I'm sure he knew she agreed. And I fully expect this abuser to lash out at me. That's what they do. Uh, when this confrontation continues. Um, it's unacceptable, and I hope you guys take appropriate action. I'm not going to read anything further uh, regarding what's abuse, uh, but these coaches are trained on what abuse is. They know what it is, and it's unacceptable. Please take appropriate action. Do you have any questions for me as I'm here now? We're not allowed to. We have questions and answers. I'm sorry, but I do appreciate you coming. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, last speaker is, um, please apologize, Karen Lawler. Lawler. Hello, I apologize. Um, I am from East Finley Township, and again, I am here in regards to Coach Andrew. Um, this morning, my husband and I uh, sent an email to Coach Dalton, members of the school board, and appropriate principals. Uh, our understanding is not only is Coach Andrew the head coach of the girls' varsity team, but the assistant coach to the junior varsity team. He is verbally and mentally abusive to not just one girl, but to all the girls. Um, I would not want him to coach any child. I fear for his child for the way in which he speaks to people. Um, when we came to McGuffey School District in my daughter's freshman year, which would have been 22-23, I asked Andrew why my daughter was not playing. And I was told he doesn't play freshmen. Please understand that my husband and I took our daughter to a private coach and made sure that she was well prepared to play varsity ball in her freshman year. So we said, okay, we respect that. And um, during that freshman year, there were a multitude of incidences where not one, but 10 girls walked out of the locker room after a game in tears because Andrew Prusak used verbal profanity towards them and so forth. Our daughter wanted to quit. Her love for basketball very much came through. So this past season, my daughter wanted to play again in hopes that she would actually see court time. Nothing improved. As a matter of fact, it proceeded to worsen. Um, he started playing freshman over upperclassmen. The uh, freshman did not bring anything substantial to the team. Um, she was not a once-in-a-lifetime player. I'm sorry, just being honest here. Um, we were at a game in Charleroi. And the he, players were coming off the court, I believe it was between quarters. And he forcefully grabbed the girl's arm and jerked her backwards. Um, then there was another one where at the Fort Cherry game, it, the day before the snow day, our senior had four fouls on her. It's time for a foul shot, Fort Cherry to shoot. Andrew looks at her and goes, how the fuck did you get four pounds? I don't speak to my children that way. I don't speak to other people's children that way. And I'll be damned if I let somebody else speak to mine that way. And of course, at multiple practices, there were things that were divided. Coach Andrew worked with his starters. You weren't a starter. You were sent to the other end of the gym to shoot baskets. So when the girls that shot the baskets went to play, and they didn't maneuver or follow the plays that he wanted them to, he would stand on the side of the court, scream and yell profanities, and yell at the girls because they didn't know what they were doing. But never mind the fact that they weren't taught. They didn't know the play. That's not my fault. That's not the girls' fault. That's Andrew's fault. I realize we're not in kindergarten, and not everything is equal, but we're adults. We're trying to raise good young adults. We all have to set examples. Andrew sure isn't doing that. You know, um, <clears throat> I am a nurse. My husband is a minister. We have license. If we, we technically should have reported this. In some instances, 
because our license very much can be on the line for this. He shouldn't be coaching. He's been fired from two colleges for some reason. Did anybody look into his previous record, get any form of a personal referral for him before we hired him here as a coach? I mean, I know that people do it for teachers or for principals, things like that. I think we need to do it for coaches also. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, that concludes. Thank you, Chief. Thank you to all who participated. At this time, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the February 15, 2024 school board meeting as submitted. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carried. In motion to approve the general fund, fund, excuse me, general fund schedule of bills from February 14th to March 21st, 2024, check 78906 to 6 to 79038, and the amount of $797,673, I can't speak tonight, and 32 cents as a minute. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We need a motion to approve the food service schedule of bills dated March 21st, 2024, check 7736 to 7741, and the amount of $51,443.03 is submitted. So moved. Second. Evidently, I can't read either. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We need a motion to approve the treasurer's report for the month of February 2024 as submitted. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We need a motion to approve the GOB series 2021 bill list dated March 21st, 2024, check 21050, and the amount of $38,260.56 is submitted. So moved. I'd just like to add that I read that and spoke it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Suspension? Motion carries. Oh, this is an announcement mm -hmm. from Dr. Over. I have the pleasure to announce the 10-year permanent professional employee status has been earned by Joel Ames. She is our Hello, elementary librarian for both Joe Walker and Clazel. As a result of three consecutive years of satisfax teaching, in the Modesto School District and fulfillment of the requirements set forth by the Pennsylvania Code. Congratulations to Joel. Congratulations. We have a motion to accept the donation of $5,000 from CNX Foundation for the terms of McGuffey School District Policy Number 702, Gifts, Grants, and Donations. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension, motion carries. We need a motion to accept the donation from the Society for Analytical Chemists of Pittsburgh Middle School Equipment Grant of $600, $600 per the term of McGuffey School District Policy Number 702, Gift Grants and Donations. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension, motion carries. We need a motion to approve to use the updated Highlander Ogle. Logo. So moved. <laughs> Having a night, all I can say. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize we had discussion. Um, it doesn't have to be done tonight. Um, the goal would be to start working on it. Uh, Vince and his team, we have students that we're going to start having a club that's going to be responsible for creating the video. I'd like to have that image, though, before the start of next year, because we want to start. Actually, the, the donation that you just approved, this $5,000, uh, we're going to use that to start creating wraps that unify that image along with other things that are all of our buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the question was, I thought you had a very good idea when you could have some students participate in help and develop or tips, or do you think that it's worth that now? I mean, do you think we need any involvement? Do you not want to? Well, 
No, at this point, and again, it was something at the very beginning, and it was really just the process. The process was little pieces here and there. It wasn't, if it, if it had changed into something and morphed into something different, then absolutely, I thought it was going to be two different images or something different. But it just it was such a process that we got into it and we said, what, what are we really going to show them? Just the differences in the gray versus the gold. So I, 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 I agree with that. I, I wish we could have done something that would have involved a little bit more in that. It was, it was such that oftentimes we would just be on the phone or we'd be in a video call and it would be just a small little tweak. And at this point, we'll actually have four logos. We'll have the gray um, outline, outline mm -hmm. the gold outline in both the full mm -hmm. and, the head. and in the torso. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Any other discussion? Great job. <laughs> yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Having the motion to approve the overnight trip for the boys varsity, junior varsity basketball team to travel to Orlando Universal to play six games for Friday, December 20th, 2024 through Monday, December 23rd, 2024 at no cost to the district. Second. Are there, is there any discussion there? The same group that last year got trains down there. Um, yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, it is. It, it, yes, it, it is, is around it Christmas. Transportation. Yeah. We'll, we'll wish them well this time. I, I have a question. Those dates, and I'm really just look at the calendar, I should have, but um, the 20th to the 23rd, that's over Christmas break or? So the 20th, okay. the 20th actually is our last day before Christmas break, so there is school in session that day. Yeah. But because the question about the cost, there's no substitute teacher. It's well, uh, so this is uh, Mike Benigani, uh and he takes the staff. We have uh, two individuals that also would be going down with them that are in our middle school staff, so there would be that need. That but it wasn't on there, that's yeah, why. That, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when we say no cost to the district, there will be a cost for substitutes Substitute. for two individuals. Do we need to change that? A lot of this. Um, that's not part of this right here. So would we need three then? Because Mr. Three. Patagani said... Yeah, we would need three. Three, three. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. Three. Do we need to reword our... How that's written? Or are we okay with that? We should. We should. Yes. So I need a motion to amend the, um, the motion to include... Uh, to change at no cost to the cost of three substitutes. For the Friday, December 20th. For Friday, December 20th. You don't have to... Say all that if you just make that. I'll make that motion. Thank you. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Is there any other discussion there? No. No, that's not. That, that's going to be. But I don't think you yeah. do that anymore. No. I didn't think so. What budget would that come to? That would be after um, out of our substitute teacher. That, that's where that would be directed pulled from. There's a budget for that. Mm -hmm. And typically, if it's not, it'll say that it's right. not budgeted. Right. Right. Um, it's, we don't always include the words that it is part of the budget, but because typically, if it's not, it'll say it's not. Um, but uh, to go back to the question that was asked earlier about why this one looks different than FFAs at different times, um, is there an answer to that, or? Right. Well, they don't have the ability to fundraise like sports programs do. You'll notice that there is um, fundraising the FFA does. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, not to the extent what you're talking about here is actually a, a booster organization for the boys basketball that has every year fundraise actually specifically for this particular trip. They do other things, too, of course, but that's... So while that. FFA tries, for example, because that was the question that was asked, FFA tries to incorporate all of their trips within their budget, correct, to kind of account for that. These sports organizations, sometimes these things will come up and the boosters are covering the cost. Mm -hmm. So that would be the reason why they're different. And, and, and I think the other thing, I was going to say, that, yeah, right. and I would say the other thing is, too, this, this would be, um, it is part of 
the, the boys' basketball program to actually go to, to Florida, but it's not uh, something that's, that's yeah, right. It's not something that's sanctioned within the FAL. And the FSA is an academic yeah. yeah. academic program, correct? Yeah. Right. So. In regards to that, with like FSA coming and asking to, you know, like last, well, last month's question, it was we weren't spending anything because it was already budgeted, but they were still asking to use that fund. Is that, am I understanding that yes, correctly? Yes, that's fair. Mm -hmm. So I know we don't see like, like football games and different things that students travel to, um, you know, things like that. Is there a reason why we see FSA ask to spend that money and not? like a football team or the basketball team or whoever. Again, I think you're talking about the difference between extracurricular versus academic mm -hmm. or co-curricular. So Sports or extracurricular. I guess the other thing, too, okay. is when, when you look at, so for example, the FFA, they often go to uh, the, the last thing I think we approved was from the go to the state convention. Right. Um, and that requires overnight food. Mm -hmm. um, that, of course, that travel, that, that professional development for the staff and, of course, the students is something that's budgeted for. Just like you brought up football, mm -hmm. the buses that we use for that are budgeted for prior to that year. So Ed will come to us and say, I need X amount of dollars because we have so many away games. So okay. that's built into the budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, because I know this is often confused, mm -hmm. FFA is not like a, a club. Right. Or an act it is it is academic. Right. It is co curricular. Right. Uh, so it's that's vocational. A very thing. Vocational education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank and, you. And typically I don't think the football team, as long as I can remember, really goes to like Disney or or some mm -hmm. big trip like that. Not that I remember. No, but and I do <laughs> think that that's correct if, if we've had um like if they were going to states or something, yeah, I would imagine that would, that would come up. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Always in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Dissension? Motion carried. Do we have a need for executive session? Yes, Madam President. One item: personnel. I need a motion. the motion to move to executive session. I'll make the motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Same. Motion carries. We are in executive session at 7.34 p.m.